Today we'll study sections 117 through 122 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Let's first of all take a look at the timeline to get some idea of events that led up to section 117 through 122. Let's go back to 1837. This is a year where events led to what we see taking place in 1838. Earlier, we studied that on April 3rd, 1836, that our Savior came to the temple in Kirtland, and that Moses, Elias, and Elijah also appeared there and restored vital, important keys for the work of God in these latter days. In January of 1837, the Kirtland Safety Society Anti-Banking Company opens. Well, just in a few months, in the same year, we find the 1837 money panic taking place throughout the, what was then the United States. Remember, Kirtland was not the only place being affected by this financial crisis. All of the nation at that time was suffering from the exact same phenomena. But it's interesting, people living in Kirtland, not seeing and taking into account that entire picture, would find ways to blame the prophet Joseph Smith for their financial failings. They found themselves, prior to that, experiencing prosperity that we already talked about before. And when prosperity is threatened, it is amazing how people's hearts change when their hearts are set upon finances and the things of the world. I think probably we even know from personal experiences how hearts of people change when it comes to financial matters. At the same time that this was happening, and even very important people were apostatizing from the church and turning away from Joseph Smith because of those events, at about that same time, the Lord instructed the prophet Joseph Smith to call the first missionaries to Great Britain. And so those first elders leave and it resulted in tremendous success of thousands and thousands of wonderful, humble people embracing the fullness of the gospel who would later come over here to the United States and arrive during the Nauvoo period, greatly strengthening the church. By August of that very same year, a meeting was broken up in the Kirtland Temple by John F. Boynton and Warren Parrish. They were some of the very top leaders of the church and some of the most trusted people, but their hearts had been turned against the prophet. Again, because of the financial situation, they felt it easy to blame the Lord's anointed. To the point where there were enough people who were in the church who were set against the prophet Joseph Smith and seeking to destroy him, they were threatening his life. So in January of 1838, the prophet had to flee from Kirtland for his own life. It wasn't until March that he arrived in far west Missouri. Notice the sections that were given during this period of time. Section 113 through section 116 that we studied last week. That is where we learned about Adam and Diamond and the great future that lies ahead. A great meeting is going to take place there that will involve the prophets of all ages, Adam himself, Michael the Archangel, and our Savior Jesus Christ. In July of that same year, four new apostles are called to fill the vacancies of those who had apostatized in Kirtland, Ohio. And also the law of tithing was revealed. Another group of faithful saints that had remained in Kirtland now start heading to far west to catch up with the prophet. In August, more of the Kirtland saints left Kirtland heading for far west Missouri. In September of 1838, the Kirtland camp arrived in Missouri. So we have September, October, just one month later, Lilburn W. Boggs, the governor of Missouri, issues the extermination order. The Hans Mill massacre occurred and Joseph Smith and others were arrested. So with that in the background, let's start going through these sections. Probably just to get a little bit more information here, I'll read this blue part. 
After the prophet Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon fled Kirtland, Ohio in January 1838, William Marks was appointed to oversee the church in Kirtland and to settle the prophet's and Sidney Rigdon's business affairs there. Newell K. Whitney remained as the bishop in Kirtland, overseeing the temporal operations of the church there. But Brother Marks and Bishop Whitney apparently understood that they should quickly settle the church's affairs and then move to Missouri in accordance with the 12th of January, 1838 Revelation, directing faithful saints to relocate there. However, by July 6, 1838, when a large group of saints left Kirtland, Ohio, for Missouri, Brother Marks and Bishop Whitney were still living in Kirtland. So that'll give us a little bit more understanding of what the Lord is addressing here in section 117. Verse 1, Verily thus saith the Lord unto my servant, William Marks, and also my servant, Newell K. Whitney, let them settle up their business speedingly and journey from the land of Kirtland before I, the Lord, send again the snows upon the earth. To me, I take a mental diversion right there and contemplate that what the Lord is saying when he says, I, the Lord, send again the snows upon the earth. It's easy to forget how much power and control God has over everything, even the weather that we take for granted. It rains one day, it's hot another day, it's cold another day. God, our Father, and our Savior, Jesus Christ, are over all of that, and they're controlling it. And when he says that he is going to send the snows upon the earth, that just shows he's the one who's making all these decisions. And sometimes we go, well, that, that wasn't very good weather. That was terrible weather for that situation. Look all the things that happened, or wow, we are so grateful for this weather. Well, we should be grateful because it is our Heavenly Father. And when the weather is not good and it causes trouble, we will one day find out the Lord has his own reasons. He is in control. Verses 1 through 4, the Lord teaches us some principles. Let's look at verse 4, talking about Brother Marks and Bishop Newell K. Whitney. Let them repent of all their sins and of all their covetous desires before me, saith the Lord, for what is property unto me, saith the Lord? That's an excellent question. We each form an attachment to one degree or another, that which we have purchased, that which we have saved up money to build up the property, to build up what's upon that property, to take care of the property. It's something we can become attached to with our hearts. But the Lord, who is over property, in other words, worlds without number in this universe, he asks the question, what is property to me? He sees worlds come and go. He sees them restored. As one world passes away, another comes in its place. He sees how fleeting attachment to property is, how one person who has purchased land and remains on it, he later dies, and that property is no longer his, and he owned that property or thought he owned it when in fact he was merely a steward over that property because Christ is the one who owns the property. And yet that mortal person only had stewardship over it a very short period of time. The reason I bring this up is I guess it's something we should all consider. Sometimes the Lord does ask people to leave their property and to go on to other places to do his work. Other times, he doesn't make a big deal of that, and people remain on their property as wise stewards, giving all glory and honor to him, taking good care of that property, yet at the same time, dedicating their time, their talents, and everything which they have to the Lord and his restored church and kingdom here upon this earth. In other words, they are consecrated. So he gives further instructions here. Let the properties of Kirtland be turned out for debts, saith the Lord. Let them, the properties, go, saith the Lord, and whatsoever remains, let it remain in your hands. In other words, sell the properties as much as you can to pay the debts of the church. 
Then he goes on in verse 6 and continues to instruct what he started with over here in verse 1, where he says that I, the Lord, send again the snows upon the earth. He says, do I not, over here in verse 6, do I not hold the destinies of all the armies of the nations of the earth? Therefore, will I not make solitary places to bud and to blossom and to bring forth in abundance? And then he goes on and continuing with that same thought, he mentions Adam and Diamond. And then a little bit more of the geography of Adam and Diamond, which takes us way back to the beginning days of mortality here upon this earth when Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden, which we learned last week was actually in Jackson County, Missouri, and then moved north and settled in what we know today as Adam and Diamond. But something else that the Lord talks about in passing that he knows because he knows all time and he was the one that was there with Adam and Eve, that they came to Adam and Diamon and an area, I don't even know how to pronounce it, but I'll give it a try, Eloah Shina, or the land where Adam dwelt. So that's just a little bit more information, kind of fascinating. And so he's asking, is there not room enough in the mountains of those areas where Adam dwelt that you should cover that which is but the drop and neglect the more weighty matters? He's asking not only Brother Marks and Bishop Whitney these questions. This really is addressed to every saint in the church. Where are our priorities? Do we set the things of the world as the most important things of our life? Or is our Savior, His commandments, His character, and the objective to acquire His character in our lives and to serve Him the utmost of priority in our hearts? In verse 11, he counsels Bishop Newell K. Whitney to be ashamed of the Nicolaitan band and of all their secret abominations. That takes us back to the book of Revelation, where the Lord gave the same warning to members of the church back then. Basically, that word means worldly church members, those who are involved in secret combinations. Remember that Kirtland had once been a place of faith and tremendous miracles and outpouring of Pentecostal events with the dedication of the Kirtland Temple, where so many people received personal miracles and collective miracles as a group. They were eyewitnesses. They were personal witnesses. And it is interesting how the affairs of the world can change a person's heart who has even experienced such great things. And those people whose hearts had changed were remaining in Kirtland, most of them. Now, by the way, we're going to find out that some of them actually left Kirtland and came to Far West and started causing trouble. But a lot of them remained in Kirtland. In other words, Bishop Whitney, why are you staying with these people? They have secret combinations. They, even using the name of religion and using the name of the Lord, are fighting against the Lord's prophet and thus fighting against the Lord. In other words, in the name of Christ, they are actually antichrist. So again, the Lord extends the invitation to come up to the land of Adam and Diamond and be a bishop unto my people, not in name, but in deed. And then over here in verse 12, the Lord says, I remember my servant, Oliver Granger. Behold, verily I say unto him, that his name shall be had in sacred remembrance from generation to generation forever and ever. Let's learn a little bit about Oliver Granger. President Boyd K. Packer stated here in the blue, when the saints were driven from Kirtland, Oliver was left behind to sell their properties for what little he could. There was not much chance that he could succeed. And really, he did not succeed. He had been commissioned by the First Presidency to a task that was difficult, if not impossible. But the Lord commended him for his apparently unsuccessful efforts in these words. 
I remember my servant Oliver Granger. Behold, verily I say unto him, that his name shall be had in sacred remembrance from generation to generation, for ever and ever, saith the Lord. Therefore let him contend earnestly for the redemption of the first presidency of my church. And when he falls, he shall rise again, for his sacrifice shall be more sacred unto me than his increase, saith the Lord. And then President Packer says, that may be true of all of us. It's not our successes, but rather our sacrifice and our efforts that matter to the Lord. Some critics of the church attack this verse, saying, really, who is Oliver Granger? Nobody's ever heard of him. This is a false prophecy that he would be remembered. Well, let's take a look at one or two things. The Lord does not say who would remember Oliver Granger or that his name would be world famous. Instead, these words imply he would be remembered by God and even Oliver Granger's posterity. Also, his name is here in the Doctrine and Covenants, read by millions of saints. Let's now go to section 118. This is a revelation where the Lord replaces those who had fallen in Kirtland, Ohio, namely John F. Boynton. He was excommunicated in 1837. Luke S. Johnson. He withdrew in 1837. However, he returned and was rebaptized on March 6th, 1846. He traveled with the first pioneer company helped settle and build Salt Lake City, and served as a bishop in Tooele. He died in Salt Lake City in 1861. It fascinates me of those who were caught up in this apostate attitude that there are several very significant people who after all was said and done, after all the hatred, after all the anger, after all the accusations that humbled themselves, and realized they had stepped into Satan's arena and were filled with those emotions that are only inspired by Satan, which in turn invites more inspiration from Satan. Several of these people humbled themselves and realized how terribly wrong they were and came back to the church, confessed their sins, and were welcomed back and served faithfully in the gospel the rest of their lives. Sadly, that was not true for William E. McClellan or Lyman E. Johnson. Here's a little paper here of those men who had fallen. John F. Boynton, Lyman E. Johnson, Luke S. Johnson. It's a fascinating overview of their lives. It's interesting that John F. Boynton, in fact, I should say all of them, remain friendly to the church the rest of their lives. They never fought against the church. They never wrote disparaging information. They never became what others would be known as, as anti or against the church. As a matter of fact, John Boynton, I should mention that he became an inventor. In fact, he became quite recognized for his scientific achievements and so forth. One time, John Boynton came to Nauvoo, and there he visited with a prophet as a friend, and visited the prophet more than once as a friend. Down here in the very last paragraph, it says, Of the three forgotten apostles, Lyman E. Johnson died out of the church and apparently out of harmony with himself, because one time when Lyman Johnson met with the Quorum of the Twelve, he explained that from the time he left the church, he never knew a moment of peace in his life. John F. Boynton found honor and worldly glory outside the church, but failed to endure in the things that mattered most. Luke S. Johnson, though out of the church for several years, returned to the fold and made a contribution to the upbuilding of the saints' western settlements. So new apostles are about to be called. And here are the qualifications the Lord asks for. Let the residue continue to preach from that hour. And by the way, he's also speaking to those apostles who remain faithful. And if, so conditional, if they will do this, 
in all lowliness of heart, in meekness and humility and long-suffering. Sometimes our greatest battle is against our own pride. And if we find ourselves struggling in that way, maybe one of the first things we can do is we rise every morning and reorient ourselves, recommit ourselves to our Savior and the covenants that we have made with Him, is to also humble ourselves before the Lord, willing to learn His ways. And if his ways are higher than our ways, we're willing to learn them and submit and yield to them. This would be a lowly heart. This would be a meek and humble person. And if the members of the Quorum of the Twelve do this, I, the Lord, give unto them a promise that I will provide for their families, and an effectual door shall be open for them from henceforth. This promise, I'm sure, applies to more than just the faithful apostles. I'm sure it applies to each faithful member of the church. So, in verse 4, the Lord calls them on a mission. And next spring, let them depart to go over the great waters and there promulgate my gospel, the fullness thereof, and bear record of my name. In other words, they were called to go back to Great Britain and continue the work that had already been started there. In fact, when they went to Great Britain, the work blossomed in greater fold than it had done before. And then this directive in verse 5, Let them take leave of my saints in the city of Far West on the 26th day of April next, on the building spot of my house, saith the Lord. Well, at that time, the Lord knew what was going to happen, but the saints didn't know what was going to happen. So let's see if we can get a little background here. On that day that the Lord told them to leave on their missions, little did they know, did the Missouri saints know, that they would have been expelled from Missouri by that time. And they were refugees in the state of Illinois. So here's a little bit more background. Brigham Young and the other faithful apostles fulfilled this prophecy. They left their families in Quincy, Illinois, just weeks after escaping Missouri. Now, you can imagine they did not have beautiful land and homes built within those few weeks. They were living in destitute circumstances. But under those circumstances, they, following this directive, the apostles joined together those who were still faithful and traveled from Illinois back through enemy territory where it was now legal in the state of Missouri to kill members of this church. So after holding a meeting on that date, as they made their way right back to far west Missouri, and by the way, they traveled into far west at night, so after holding a meeting on that date, early in the morning, and ordaining newly called apostles, they traveled back to Quincy, Illinois. Finally, in early August of that year, about six months later, the apostles left Illinois to serve missions in England, despite the fact that some were very sick with malaria. Those things that would be excuses for many people to... I can't go. I'm sick. I'm terribly sick. These men, Heber C. Kimball particularly, and Brigham Young, were very, very sick with malaria. In fact, their entire families were sick. And they obeyed the commandment of the Lord nevertheless, knowing the promise that if they would be lowly of heart, meek, humble, and long-suffering, that the Lord would provide for their families. And they had full trust. The new apostles who were called at that point in verse 6 were John Taylor, John E. Page, Wilfred Woodruff, and Willard Richards. And they were appointed to fill the places of those who had fallen. Section 119 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Up to this time, the Lord had been trying to teach his saints to live the law of consecration. The saints showed that it was their will to live a lesser law. The Lord does not force people to be obedient. 
And so he honors agency. So he adjusted the law of consecration to fit more in alignment with what the saints were willing to do. But as time went on, they showed they were not willing to even live the law on that level. So the Lord shifted it again. It was changed three or four times because of the nature of the saints themselves. Eventually, the law of consecration just was not effective because the members of the church as a whole would not submit to the principles that would make it functional. So here in the yellow, in the heading, because of failure on the part of many to abide by this covenant, the law of consecration, the Lord withdrew it for a time and gave instead the law of tithing to the whole church. The prophet asked the Lord how much of their property he required for sacred purposes. The answer was this revelation. So really, it all comes down here to verse 4, or actually 3 and 4. And this shall be the beginning of the tithing of my people. And after that, those who have thus been tithed shall pay one-tenth of all their interest annually. And this shall be a standing law unto them forever. For my holy priesthood, saith the Lord. Well, let's take a look at some background here. The Lord gave a twofold response to the prophet Joseph Smith's inquiry concerning how much tithing church members should pay. First, the Lord said, I require all their surplus property to be put in the hands of the bishop of my church. And then he explained the purpose for doing so. Thus, church members would give property or possessions to the bishop after all their needs were met. During a council meeting held shortly after the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 19 was received, surplus property was defined as property such as land or cattle that the owners could not make use of or to advantage. The second part of the Lord's answer to the prophet's inquiry required the saints to pay one-tenth of all their interest annually. The First Presidency gave the following definition of tithing. The simplest statement we know of is the statement of the Lord himself, namely, that the members of the church should pay one-tenth of all their interest annually, which is understood to mean income. No one is justified in making any other statement than this. So, in effect, we are the principal. Our earnings are our interest. And let me read that again. We, you and I, we're the principal, and our earnings are our interest. Joseph Fielding Smith made an insightful remark because some people try to just think it through as much as they can of how they can keep as much as they can and give as little as they can to the Lord and still be within the bounds of tithing. President Joseph Fielding Smith said, if we are stingy with the Lord, he may be stingy with us, or in other words, withhold his blessings. Section 120, the question came up, well, who is to manage the tithing and how is this to be done? So a very simple revelation from the Lord. It is to be the first presidency, the presiding bishop. It says the bishop in his council, but at that time that meant the presiding bishop and it remains the same to this day. And my high council at that time meant the quorum of the 12 apostles. And so it is understood to this very day, that is how it is to be banished. So this is the council of the disposition of tithes, the first presidency, the presiding bishop, and the quorum of the 12 apostles. Now we come to section 121 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Let's go back and look at some timelines here. We're just looking at the year 1838. On July 4th, of course, that's Independence Day, and the church had a big celebration there in far west Missouri. Great speeches were given. And uh, I believe it was on that occasion that Sidney Rigdon gave what was called the Salt Sermon. He was filled with a lot of emotion of memory of what the saints had endured in the state of Missouri. 
And things he said in that were very good, but also extremely misinterpreted as being threatening to the people of Missouri. So in many ways, that speech caused some ripple effects that led the wrong direction. On that same occasion on July 4th, there is a cornerstone lane for the Far West Temple. So it was a very, very important day as the saints were looking forward to building a temple where at last more of the covenants of the Lord could be revealed and where they could enter into and embrace those covenants and be more of a protected people. It was by that time, by October, some key members of the church had found themselves apostatizing from the church. That included Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, John Whitmer, William W. Phelps, Lyman Johnson, and others. It is so interesting, and I think we have all had the experience of being in company where people start finding fault with someone who is not in that company. And then that fault finding grows and it starts exaggerating, it grows more, and it starts becoming very, very distorted. The spirit of evil enters because Satan is the author of that type of thinking and those kind of emotions. People who were once very good at heart can lose all hold of charity, all hold of God's love, and start speaking against and slandering very, very good people. Maybe those good people have some faults. Who does not have faults? But they can be incredibly distorted when they are under the power of Satan or when those who are saying those accusations are under the power of Satan. And even with very good men, as such as those that I just named, that phenomena can take place. They can become belligerent and they can turn their faces against the Lord's anointed. And when they turn their faces against the prophet of God, they have turned their faces against God and even our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is a very severe and serious state of affairs. Well, there were members of the church who were afraid of these people who left the church. They worried that those who apostatized with the church would go over to the mob's side in Missouri and inflame the mobs to attack the saints all the more. So a group of members of the church formed a group called the Danites. They were more of a, of a vigilante group. I think their first intent was to just make sure that those people who had apostatized didn't stay around to join with those who were the mobs of Missouri. So the Danites left the boundaries of proper protocol and the counsel of the Lord. They wrote threatening letters to those men who had apostatized and actually threatened their lives. So we find that those very men, David Whitmer, Oliver Cowdery, and the others, they had to flee Missouri because of the threats of this band of people. I'm sure that Joseph Smith was aware of some of the things, but he was not aware of everything that went on because they kept themselves as a separate group. They decided to take the law in their own hands. And in doing so, they were breaking the very directives and principles that the Lord had revealed in previous revelations. So little did they know that in the name of trying to solve problems in the church and protect the saints, they were actually causing more problems by infuriating the Missourians all the more. There was another matter that we have to remember here. The religious differences between the members of the church who were extremely religious, at least the faithful members of the church, were very devoted to Jesus Christ, very devoted to his prophets, and very devoted to the revelations the Lord was giving to his prophet. However, the Missourians were quite a different group of people. They were basically very non-religious. They had a different framework of defining life. So therefore, there's a vast difference between the two cultures, but also a major difference were their political differences. Missouri was a slave state. And the Missourians wanted to keep the right to be able to hold slaves. The members of the church were anti-slavery. 
they knew it was wrong. As a matter of fact, they knew by revelation from our Heavenly Father that slavery was wrong. So this one issue alone produced a very strong dividing line between the members of the church and the Missourians. The Missourians feared that as the church members continued to come into the state of Missouri, that their voting block would finally become larger than the native Missourians. And eventually, the members of the church would vote Missouri to not be a slave state. So the emotional fury in their hearts is the basis for much of what was going on and that rippled out to other issues. So on October 24th, affidavits were submitted by Thomas B. Marsh and Orson Hyde accusing Joseph Smith of seeking to take over the state of Missouri, the United States, and the world. Governor Boggs looked at that as treason. And any efforts that the Danites had done to try to defend the members of the church against the mobs or any proactive things that they did to disrupt the mobs were also considered treason against the state of Missouri. So with all of these elements boiling up together, finally on October 25th, the members of the church were aware that some of the members of the church had been held captive by what they considered to be mobs, but by Missouri were considered to be the Missouri militia. And so a battle at Crooked River took place. There were injuries and deaths on both sides. When the reports arrived to Governor Boggs of that battle, they were extremely exaggerated. There only were just a few, I think three members of the church and one Missourian was killed. But by the time it had reached Governor Boggs, the reports were over 60 Missourians had been slaughtered by the members of the church. And then, with those slanderous affidavits from Thomas B. Marsh and Orson Hyde combined, this is what Governor Boggs had in his hand as information, from which he made his decision to issue the extermination order. Within just a few days after that order was issued, the Hans Mill Massacre occurred under the name of the extermination order. On November 1st through the 3rd, Joseph Smith and others were arrested on charges of treason and Far West was pillaged. Let's go back to Orson Hyde. On October 24th, 1838, he affixed his signature to a slanderous affidavit of Thomas B. Marsh that vilified the prophet. As a result, his fellowship was withdrawn. Now remember, what leads a person to apostasy? And all the things that contradict the teachings of our Heavenly Father that an apostate person adapts into their thinking and into their emotions. This is what Brother Marsh later confessed that he became a victim to. But back to Brother Orson Hyde. By the spring of 1839, Orson felt sorrow and later, later lamented, few men pass through life without leaving some traces which they would gladly obliterate. Happy is he whose life is free from stain and blemish. I sinned against God and my brethren. I acted foolishly. I seek pardon of all whom I have offended, and also of my God. If you had been the saints who had been victims of his affidavit and Thomas B. Marsh's affidavit, how would you have felt? What would have been your attitude if you were there to hear this confession from Orson Hyde? It's interesting that here it says his confession was accepted and he was reunited with the saints in faith and in the apostleship. It is interesting that just a few short years later, Orson Hyde was called to a mission to England and then to continue from England to the Holy Land to dedicate the land of Israel for the return of the Jews. 
after this state of apostasy and just pure repentance, was given the privilege of receiving the keys of the gathering to dedicate the land of Israel for the return of the Jews. How would we have felt if we were the people 20 years later sitting there under the Bowery in Salt Lake City, watching Thomas B. Marsh coming to the stand, explaining the reasons for his apostasy, and then his confession and pleading that the members of the church would accept him back into the kingdom. And then President Brigham Young standing up and saying, all those who will receive Brother Marsh back into full fold and fellowship of the church of Jesus Christ, please raise your hand. How would you have felt? It's interesting that the members of the church all rose their hand and forgave them. And remember, it was the members of the church, many of them, who were raising their hand and accepting these people back into the church who had suffered the most from the things those leaders had done while they were in a state of apostasy. There are some lessons to be learned here. By the way, I've shown this before in previous classes, but here's an actual photograph of Governor Boggs's extermination order. It still exists, and the original document is there. This is the front and turned over in the back, and you can still see the writing through the paper of the front page. Here is that statement. Within that, and this is typed out so we can read it a little easier, where Governor Boggs penned, the Mormons must be treated as enemies and must be exterminated or driven from the state if necessary. And then here is a photograph of the rescind order given by Christopher Bond, governor of the state of Missouri. And let's see the date on here. Filed June 25th, 1976. And it was finally discovered that Governor Boggs's extermination order had not been rescinded. And it was still legal after all those years to kill a member of the church in the state of Missouri. And when that was found, Governor Bond rescinded that order with this document. The prophet and several other companions, namely Hiram Smith, Lyman White, Caleb Baldwin, Alexander McRae, and Sidney Rigdon. Sidney was imprisoned there for a time, but became so extremely ill that the guards finally let him go free. But the others had to remain. They were arrested on the charge of treason, but they had not been convicted of that crime. They had not been held in a court where a jury weighed all the evidence. And there they were in that prison for that period of time. It was in a place where there was no heat. In fact, here is a picture of the jail. Just as stone cold as it could possibly be. There was no facilities to keep it warm. And they were there during the coldest months of the winter. In fact, that year was known as one of the coldest years in Missouri history. There they suffered beyond what you and I can understand. When we were studying the course covering the book Saints, we went into a lot of detail about this. But today, what we'll do is study more about the section and what we can learn from the section. So we go to verse 1. And by the way, I should show you another thing. Sections 121 through 123 are excerpts from a very, very long letter. It was a 29-page letter written by the prophet Joseph Smith on two different occasions. As the prophet is expressing the circumstances that they are living in, the circumstances and plight of all the saints who had been expelled from Missouri, their sufferings, and also pleading with the Lord in this letter. This is taken from BYU studies that was printed in the year 2000, and you can look this up online. And this is the full letter as it was written, even with the original spelling and with any crossouts or mistakes that have been made in rewording and so forth. But in this letter, the prophet would say how he was praying or pleading with the Lord, and then the Lord would answer. And later on, Brigham Young 
thought that these answers of the Lord were so important to every one of us that he had those answers contained within this 29-page letter placed within the Doctrine and Covenants, for they, in fact, are revelations from our Savior, Jesus Christ. In the letter, the prophet writes, O oh God, where art thou? Back in the book of Psalms, we find even King David pleading the very same. And then we go to the book of Matthew, where Jesus Christ is going through the atonement process. And then he is hanging upon the cross, and he cries, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Even our Savior felt abandoned. It is interesting that if God's prophets, if his anointed, and our very Savior himself can come to that point in life, that it should be no small thing that we would have those moments also. When times are most difficult, that the Lord doesn't seem to be found anywhere. We pray and we plead and no answers come. Now remember, by the time the prophet is writing this letter, he and the others had been in that despicable jail for months. And it was at the very last part of that stay in prison that finally, finally, after much pleading from not only the prophet, but the others who were there, that the Lord responds. And he gives answers that apply to every member of the church. In fact, even to faithful people who are not members of the church, but love the Lord with all of their hearts, with the knowledge they do have. The prophet acknowledges that God is all-powerful. In verses 5 and 6, the prophet pleads with the Lord, Let thine anger be kindled against our enemies, and in the fury of thy heart with thy sword avenge us of our wrongs. Remember thy sufferings, O our God, and thy servants will rejoice in thy name forever. Some people will think, would a prophet pray for something like this, even though he had gone through what he had and the rest of the saints were going through what they were going through? It's very interesting that if we go back to scriptures that all the Christian world accept as the word of God, we find that members of the church have prayed for the exact same thing that the prophet Joseph Smith was praying for there in Liberty Jail. In the book of Revelations, that the saints are pleading that the Lord would avenge the blood of the prophets and of the righteous saints who had been killed, and to deal with the enemies of the church. It is interesting that in chapter 19 of the book of Revelation, the day comes, or I should say, the day will come in the future when the Lord will answer all those prayers. And in chapter 19, it shows the saints in heaven rejoicing that God has exacted justice upon the unrepentant. In verse 7, the Lord says to Joseph, My son, peace be unto thy soul. Thine adversity and thine affliction shall be but a small moment. When someone's going through adversity and affliction and when they are suffering in one way or another, it doesn't seem like a small moment. Pain makes time seem much different. But to he who's master over all time, who has seen worlds come and go, and who created this world, and through geological evidence that this world has been around a tremendous amount of time, and that even from the time that men came upon here on this earth, starting with Adam and Eve, to the present, to us, those are thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and yet that is just a speck in the Lord's time in the vastness of this cosmos. He reminds Joseph that that suffering, relatively speaking, is just for a small moment. But in verse 8 comes the conditional promise, because it starts with the word, if if thou endure it well. That implies there are some people who don't endure it well, 
who maybe are angry at God or curse God or say that they will never be faithful to him again for allowing them to suffer what they're suffering. So if thou endure it well, and by the way, let's take a look at a verse from 2 Nephi 31 verse 16. And now, my beloved brethren, I know by this that unless a man shall endure to the end in following the example of the Son of the living God, he cannot be saved. That if in verse 8 is very, very critical. Therefore, we must be very careful. As I have talked with people who have chosen to turn away from the gospel and from the Lord, they will state to me some type of objection that they have and that led them to be so angry. And then I'll talk to another person and they'll state another objection they had and they don't care about the first person's objection. It means nothing to them, but something else bothers them. Then you go to a third person and something bothers them that didn't bother the first two. It's as though the adversary knows our Achilles heel. He knows exactly where to go to trouble us the most. We must be wary and ever vigilant that we are true and faithful to the end, that we will endure all that we go through in this life very well, which means to stay true to our Savior, true to his chosen prophet and apostles, true to the anointed church leadership who are following their covenants, true to the covenants we have made to the Lord, true to the commandments of God from heaven, and to never falter, to remain true to the witness of the Holy Ghost that has been given to us, although all the world tries to logically persuade otherwise that we will stand up and say, I will be true to the witness given to me that Jesus is the Christ, he has restored his church, and the prophet and first presidency and the quorum of the twelve hold all the keys that God has restored upon this earth, and I will be ever faithful and endure all things well, faithfully to our Savior. Let's go down here to verse 13. He starts talking about the enemies who have caused so much trouble and caused so much suffering to the members of the church and to Joseph and those who were there in Liberty Jail. And also, I should say, there was another prison in Richmond, Missouri, where Parley P. Pratt and others were being held, and they even had to suffer there longer than Joseph Smith did in Liberty Jail. So verse 13, also because their hearts are corrupted and the things which they are willing to bring upon others and love to have others suffer, may come upon themselves to the very utmost. We know this principle right back in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, verse 2. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. We could go on and read more and more about this principle that the Lord has revealed. He reveals it again in the New Testament, in the Doctrine and Covenants, and in the Book of Mormon. And it should give us strong reason to think about our feelings and attitudes toward others, our judgment to others. It's so easy to misunderstand. The other day, my wife and I, went to the pharmacy so that we could receive our shingle shot. We thought maybe it'd be nice to avoid having shingles in the future. And while we were there, I noticed a man. It looked like he was having a little bit of trouble walking. I assumed that he had that condition called neuropathy because he seemed to be very tender on his feet. So I just assumed that. Well, we sat down waiting for our turn to receive the vaccination. And this man came up and sat down right next to me. So he and I struck up a conversation, and he eventually started talking about one of his legs. He pulled up his trousers and showed me that he had an artificial leg. Oh, wow. All of a sudden, my whole thinking readjusted. I did not know that. I had made a wrong assumption. And then he pulled up his other pant leg, 
and that was also an artificial leg. I said, how did you lose both legs? And he told us the one leg had got an infection and it spread up through the bottom part of his leg. And it was determined the only way to save his life was to amputate his leg from his knee down. He went into the hospital and after the operation was over, he learned they amputated the wrong leg. And so over time, he had to have the leg that was actually infected amputated, and so he lost both of his legs. That was very humbling for me, how I had jumped to conclusions and made assumptions, and every one of them were wrong. And I did not understand his story, nor did I understand his suffering. President Nielsen has reminded us, correct information leads to revelation. And so this can be a pursuit in every one of our lives to learn and ask appropriate questions under appropriate circumstances and to withhold assumptions and even judgments until we know the facts. And if we don't know the facts, to withhold any assumptions or any judgments. It's interesting in verse 17, those who cry transgression do it because they are the servants of sin and are the children of disobedience themselves. That takes us right back to the Sermon on the Mount, where the Lord taught us the principle of motes and beams, that those who point out the motes in other people's eyes are actually guilty of far greater sins, that the very process of looking for fault and pointing it out is a manifestation that the person who is doing so is guilty of far greater sins. So this should be a red flag to help us in this very principle that we will be very careful and filled with charity. And then in verse 19, Woe unto them because they have offended my little ones. Remember back in Matthew 19 where the Lord talks about offending the little ones? Well, we assume it's the children. And yes, it is true. That principle refers to children. If we read Matthew 18 very carefully, we will see he is referring to new converts to the church, those whose testimonies and faith are still very tender and seeking to grow. We find that offending the little ones, the word offend in Greek actually means to cause to stumble. Woe unto them, because they cause my little ones, those who are tender in the gospel and need stronger testimonies, they have caused them to stumble. The Lord feels very strong about that. In fact, he even repeats the same wording he used back in Matthew 18. It had been better for them that a millstone had been hanged about their necks and they'd be drowned in the depths of the sea. The Lord talks very strongly about those who would destroy the faith of others. The unrepented apostates in Missouri determined that they would no longer follow the prophet of God and therefore lost the privilege of participating in the ordinances and blessings of the priesthood. Their decision to separate themselves from God's church would eventually impact their posterity after them from generation to generation and restrict these descendants' opportunities to enjoy the blessings of the gospel and the right to the priesthood. President Kimball said, Among church members, rebellion frequently takes the form of criticism of authorities and leaders. They speak evil of dignities and of the things that they understand not, says Peter. They complain of the programs, belittle the constituted authorities, and generally set themselves up as judges. After a while, they absent themselves from the church meeting for imagined offenses and fail to pay their tithes and meet the other church obligations. In a word, they have the spirit of apostasy, which is almost always the harvest of the seeds of criticism. Such people fail to bear testimony to their descendants destroy faith within their own homes, and actually deny the right to the priesthood to succeeding generations who might otherwise have been faithful in all things. Well, after making that statement, the Lord turns his attention back to the faithful saints. 
upon whom he will give great knowledge by the power of the Holy Ghost, things that had not been revealed since the world was until now. Verse 28, a time which nothing shall be withheld, whether there be one God or many gods, they shall be manifest, and thrones and dominions, principalities and powers shall be revealed and set forth upon all those who've endured valiantly for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's interesting that yet to come in the future from the time the Lord spoke these words to the prophet Joseph Smith comes sections 130 through 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants and also the King Follett Discourse delivered in 1844 in Nauvoo. In those sections and in that discourse, would these things that the Lord is referring to here in section 121, in these verses, that they are revealed to a great extent. And in due time, they will be revealed to a far greater extent. And so we will have the privilege in a few weeks to study these very sections. Well, now we come to probably the most famous verses in section 121. Behold, there are many called but few are chosen. And why are they not chosen? And then he gives the reasons. And then he gives the proper attitude, conduct, and spirit of godliness that should exist in priesthood holders and really in all members of the church. Let's see if we can better understand this. He talks about the rights and power of the priesthood and that they are conditional. Those rights and that power is conditional upon the principles of righteousness. And then he goes out of his way to enumerate them. Persuasion, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, love unfeigned. In other words, real love, not pretended love. Not the kind of love that's shown because you're on camera right now. Real love, real compassion, real charity for others. And then we add to that kindness, pure knowledge, no hypocrisy, charity toward all. And by the way, that is a gift we are to seek and pray for. Many I know already have that gift. And there are others that need to pray for it. I'm one who needs to pray for it. Let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly. The Lord specifically mentions these principles of righteousness. And then we can talk about the powers of heaven. Once a person is submitting themselves to the principles of righteousness, and if they immerse themselves in those principles and be actively striving to obtain them and to live by them, then the connection is made. The rights and power of the priesthood is then connected to the powers of heaven. And the things spoken of and done and the ordinances performed and the blessings given are connected with the powers of heaven unearthly powers, powers beyond men, powers beyond doctors, beyond medicine, beyond science, can come down from heaven and do what no man can do otherwise. I've mentioned before, in some of the greatest miracles I have personally witnessed under the power of the priesthood has been a woman standing there who had these attributes and had that connection with heaven. I say this because I am so impressed with sisters who have these attributes, and therefore how even they, in the presence of the room of where priesthood is being administered, can bring down the powers of heaven where miracles actually take place. Now, on the other hand, people want the rights and power of the priesthood, However, they exercise unrighteous dominion. They cover their sins. They gratify their pride and their vain ambition. They're controlling. 
dictatorial, demanding. Now, by the way, they're not necessarily every one of these negative attributes, but it seems that just one of these negative attributes pushes away the Spirit of the Lord and the powers of heaven. Just one alone. Some people are possessed with all of these. So let's continue. Controlling, dictatorial, demanding, impatient, harsh, angry, set in one's own ways, disobedient to God's commands, fault-finding, accusing, immoral, heart set upon the things of the world, and or the honors of men. If we want to talk about the powers of heaven in this case, it's null and void. There is no connection whatsoever. As a matter of fact, such people are severed from the righteous blessings and powers of heaven. The heavens withdraw, and the Spirit of the Lord is grieved, and the Lord specifically says in this section to such people, Amen to the priesthood or the authority of that man. One of our great life's quests, built into the covenants we make from baptism to the highest covenants in the temples, is the principles of tapping into the powers of heaven, or in other words, the power of godliness. It is through the ordinances thereof and the commitment we make in those ordinances that lead to the principles of righteousness and all these wonderful attributes that we see here on the right hand side. And that is what connects individuals to heaven when the rights and power of the priesthood are exercised. This is what the Lord is teaching all of us, is to be our great life's objective, to strive for, to pray for, and to repent again and again until we obtain each of these attributes that we may, even in this life, enjoy the greatest blessings from heaven and by the powers of heaven. So with this, let's go to section 122. This is where the Lord directly speaks to the prophet Joseph Smith and tells him of things he had already suffered, things he would suffer, and things that could be symbolic of the sufferings of many, many other people in many ways. The Lord, in His love, custom designs the challenges we have in life because they have such refining potential, and they can bring about the most good in our lives. To one person, it's one challenge. To another person, it is another challenge. So what the Lord lists here in verses 1 through 7 can be symbolic in many ways to the challenges that many people go through in life. President Uchtdorf said perhaps Pilate thought this would satisfy the mob's lust for blood when he presented Christ before the mob and said, Behold the man. Perhaps they would take pity on the man. Behold, I bring him forth to you. Pilate said that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Behold the man. The Son of God stood in the flesh before the people of Jerusalem. They could see Jesus, but they did not truly behold him. They did not have eyes to see. Those who find a way to truly behold the man find the doorway to life's greatest joys and the balm to life's most demanding despairs. So when you are encompassed by sorrows and grief, behold the man. When you feel lost or forgotten, behold the the man. When you are despairing, deserted, doubting, damaged, or defeated, behold the man. He will comfort you. He will heal you and give you meaning to your journey. He will pour out his spirit and fill your heart with exceeding joy. He gives power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increases strength when we truly behold a man, we learn of him and seek to align our lives with him. We repent and strive to refine our natures and daily grow a little closer to him. We trust him. We show our love for him by keeping his commandments and by living up to our sacred covenants. In other words, we become his disciples. 
It's interesting that in the very first part of section 122, the Lord says that Joseph's name would be held in derision. That's not a positive word, it's a very negative word. He would be slandered and verbally abused by many people, not only in his own day, but even today. So here the Lord defines who he is talking about when Moroni spoke these words. Remember when Moroni appeared to Joseph Smith in that little cabin just three years after he had seen the first vision? Moroni called Joseph Smith my name and said unto me that he was a messenger sent from the presence of God to me and that his name was Moroni, that God had a work for me to do and that my name should be had for good and evil among all nations and kindreds and tongues, or that it should be both good and evil spoken of among all people. The Lord is in a roundabout way and saying, Moroni was right. There are many who know by the Holy Ghost, you are my prophet. And there are others who turn away from the Holy Ghost and turn to the power of Satan. And they defy you and they defy me, their savior. After going through this long list of things that people could suffer, the Lord finally says in the underlying part of the red, if fierce winds become thine enemy, if the heavens gather blackness and all the elements combine to hedge up the way, and above all, if the very jaws of hell shall gape open the mouth wide after thee, know thou my son, that all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. This is what requires the great faith. And that faith in this case is synonymous with trust. Trust in God that he knows what he is doing with each of our lives. That these things have come into our lives. He's allowed them to be part of our lives because they have the potential of bringing out good, or in other words, higher levels of the divine nature than we would have achieved otherwise. Joseph B. Worthlin said, You may feel singled out when adversity enters your life. You shake your head and wonder, why me? But the dial on the wheel of sorrow eventually points to each of us. At one time or another, everyone must experience sorrow. No one is exempt. I love the scriptures because they show examples of great and noble men and women, such as Abraham, Sarah, Enoch, Moses, Joseph, Emma, and Brigham. Each of them experienced adversity and sorrow that tried, fortified, and refined their characters. Learning to endure times of disappointment, suffering, and sorrow is part of our on-the-job training. These experiences, while often difficult to bear at the time, are precisely the kinds of experiences that stretch our understanding, build our character, and increase our compassion for others. President Henry B. Irene said, so the greatest test of life is to see whether we will hearken to and obey God's commandments in the midst of the storms of life. It is not to endure storms, but to choose the right while they rage. And the tragedy of life is to fail in that test and so fail to qualify to return in glory to our heavenly home. Speaking of returning to our heavenly home, Verse 8, the Lord tells Joseph, the Son of Man, the Lord himself who is speaking these very words, Jesus Christ, hath descended below them all. He has suffered more than any person on this entire earth could conceivably suffer for everyone's sin and all the justice that is demanded for everyone's sins. He who created worlds without number, he descended below them all. And then he poses the question to the prophet Joseph and to all of us. Art thou greater than he? And then he concludes in the very last part of verse 9. Fear not what man can do, for God shall be with you forever and ever. We'll conclude with these words of President Brigham Young. 
He said, we talk about our trials and troubles here in this life, but suppose that you could see yourselves thousands and millions of years after you proved faithful to your religion during the few short years in this time and have obtained eternal salvation and a crown of glory in the presence of God, then look back upon your lives here and see the losses, crosses, and disappointments, the sorrows. You would be constrained to exclaim, but what of all that? Those things were but for a moment, and we are here now. We have been faithful during a few moments in our mortality, and now we enjoy eternal life and glory with power to progress in all the boundless knowledge and through the countless stages of progression, enjoying the smiles and approbation of our Father and God and of Jesus Christ and Elder Brother. We always hope and pray that things will go well. But in times when the Lord sends challenges our ways, these principles stated here in section 121 and 122, if understood and embraced, can lead to the exact place Brigham Young so testified for the faithful. May we be those faithful. May we have that eternal perspective. Because this gospel is true and our eternal potential is real. Those blessings of exaltation are awaiting for all of us who really love the Lord and truly endure to the end. I bear my witness again to you that this gospel is true and those eternal blessings are real and wait for our coming. And I share this with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.